joining us in this, yes, the second volume of the virtual lecture series, which is realized within the BMBF funded research project, Digital Documentary Practices, which is hosted at the University of Bayreuth, though we are quite international as we'll see in this uh, second volume. Well, after our first row of lectures a year ago, which was rather broadly dedicated to topical paradigm shifts in negotiating the real, the theme of this year's session seems to be much more narrow, though maybe it only seems to be. We want to shift our attention to one very acute topic, ecology, or to be more specific, ecologies, or ecology with a capital E, indicating the broad understanding of this quite mighty concept. So this year, we will focus on expanded documentary, ecologies of images and images of ecology. Well, as already announced in the invitation, we have got to accept that we are currently facing various global crises. Cataclysmic geopolitical distortions are shattering what we used to call our world order. Economic crises are breaking into our lives. The endangerment of democracy and human rights are omnipresent. Yet, with all these visually very present crises and their immediate impact on our daily lives, we are running the risk of pushing one concern of our time, which could be most utmost priority into the background. Without dramatizing the issue, one can state that we are living in times of ecological emergency, climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, global warming, the sea level rise, deforestation, exploitation of natural resources and extreme weather events. And though they might seem to be primarily affected to our natural environment, they also entail political radicalization, a widening divide between South and North, East and West, the challenges of the digitalization migration, systemic injustice, critical monopolization and economic dependencies. In short, the intricate entanglements which are deeply played impact on our whole existence. These various crises and their different manifestations are accompanied by a crisis of representation. Controversy and a general atmosphere of fear and uncertainty are on the rise. Documentary's truth claim is further up to debate. And given the complex interdependencies of matters and concerns, media practices need to be reconceptualized in theory as well as in practice. Hence, in this lecture series, we would like to fathom the potential of the currently expanding field of documentary theory and practices. We would like um, to think through essential issues at the intersection of rather or rather junction of media and ecology, mediatization, environment, and we will think through possibilities of how emerging, often experimental practices could contribute to a more or less um, way out of these dead ends in the mediatization in times of cataclysm. In this context, we, which means us, uh, the hosts and our invited guests, would like to invite you to explore with us different dimensions of ecologies of images and images of ecology, as Ross put it. We would like to critically engage with both concepts and conceptualizations of key clusters in this complex imbroglio. Being aware that media and mediatization, that the documentary and especially doing documentary on the one hand and environment and ecological issues on the other hand need to be distinguished in many ways, we are nonetheless suggesting that they are deeply intermingled and mutually transformative, as Alenda Zhang and Adrian Ivakin underline 
in one of their fundamental um, editorials of media environment. Well, what is hence our starting point? One of the major premises hereby is the fact that the documentary cannot be reduced to being an epistemic genre uh, as it stands alone. Rather, it is imbued with a transformative impetus and an innate an awareness of issues going alongside with politics and poetics of representation. And this applies even the more so to documentary practices in the digital realm. Hence, we are setting off from the premises that the expanding field of documentary is not formed by objects and artifacts, but that it is inhabited by lively processes of mediatization, or as Sandra Gaudenzi puts it, we are dealing here with living documentary, which brings me to the outline of the series. In this lecture series, we hope to embrace the complex and the messy. We aim to dive deep into meshworks of media, networked and networking media ecologies. We would like to retrace documentaries tradition, exploring documentaries diversifying present and envision documentaries future. We rethink notions of virtuality and actuality, interactivity, interaction and participation. We probe into the potential of polyphony and multi-perspectivity. We are interested in the more than, the more than human, the more than representational. We try to figure out how interactive documentary practices rewire the environment with its multifaceted notions, ranging from natural to infrastructural environments, from social and psychic environments always questioning the implications these practices can have. We de- and reconstruct the often auto-weight metaphorical notions of ecology in the field of media studies to apply the complex cluster with its various associations afresh in the concrete ecological oriented contexts of current environmental crisis. Or in short, we wander in the transdisciplinary landscape which opens when eco-criticism, the environmental humanities, and documentary theory and practices meet. Wondering. This brings us rather smoothly to our first lecture, which in fact is a lot about wondering, engaging with one's environment while being there in situ, discovering in place what sites might teach us, if we are open to listen to the multi-layered stories they provide. Liz Miller, I'm really honored today that we may welcome her and she will present one of her most recent projects, Wastescapes. Liz, as you might know, is a filmmaker and a full professor in communication studies at Concordia University. Though to most of you, she might well be known not at least due to a seminal web documentary, The Shoreline, or her extended documentary, Swampscapes, I would like nonetheless like to shortly introduce her. Liz, as I said, um, uh, is not only a renowned academic colleague, and she's also a highly engaged producer and author. She's also highly interested in co-creation, or in Sharon Daniels' words, she's a context provider for participatory documentary endeavors. Her multi-platform collaborative documentary projects uh, on timely issues such as water privatization, wetlands, environmental justice, and climate change have won awards and influenced decision makers. Liz is the co-author of Going Public, The Art of Participatory Practices, which was published in 2017. And she has written a book book chapters and articles on co-creation, environmental media and place-based pedagogies. These keywords, co-creation, environmental media and place-based learning are also the point of departure for today's presentation. Liz 
will introduce us to her most recent project, Wastescapes, which incorporates augmented documentary, cycling tours, installations and educational resources. Wastescapes is an augmented documentary project, as we also put on the website um, of this uh, lecture series. But it's also an app that engages creatively and critically with places, stories and concepts related to waste in the city of Montreal. On the website of the project, we can read that the project is both. It is educational and it is artistic at the same time. And as Liz already we revealed in the announcement, we can look forward to some insight into pedagogical uh, potential of augmented documentary, to the potential if we as user interactors shift our focus from character to place, from individual, most often human beings, to the more complex, to ecosystems, to ecologies, and hence, what insight can be gained if we become aware of the more than human, as well as the power dynamics of places. Yet, before I will leave the digital stage to Liz, as usual, some words on virtual housekeeping. As in the last row of the lecture, and as I already said, also this series will be recorded. And we would like to make the highly insightful lectures as resources for further research available on the project website. So please feel heartily invited not only to recap this recording, but also stroll around the archive of lectures collected here. And secondly, we are looking forward to a lively discussion at the end of Liz's presentation. So this being said, I now really leave the stage and I am excited to hand over to Liz. Well, I want to begin by thanking you, Anna, for bringing this important series together about the role of expanded documentary in a time of environmental crisis. And I also want to begin today's talk with an acknowledgement that we are using the Zoom platform for this event and that Zoom's headquarters are located on the Mawekma Alone Territory, otherwise known as San Jose, California. I myself am situated on the unceded lands of the Ganeagahaga Nation. And I will mention that Jajogi, Montreal is historically and continues to be known as a gathering place for many First Nations. So I wanna once again appreciate this gathering and the inspiring scholars and makers that Anna has so carefully convened for this series. Ecologies of Images and Images of Ecologies. The name of this talk is Wastescapes, Augmented Documentary as Critical Place Learning. And I will share my screen. So as Anna suggested, I'm gonna be talking about this project, Wastescapes, which is an augmented documentary a locative app that explores the meaning and place of waste in Chichoke, Montreal. Through the app, I've been leading tours and exploring the use of the app with other researchers, students, and educators. And I see the app as a tool for critical place-based learning, and I'm exploring it also as a site of collaboration. I've been thinking of it as a virtual community center, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So how did this project come to be? The project began as a summer course in 2020. My colleague MG Thompson and I developed a course in response to an open call at Concordia University where we both work to teach a class about a wicked problem. So together we pitched waste as the problem and cycling as our method. We began with a set of broad questions that are featured here including what values and practices shape waste production, management, and reduction? How can we use embodied pedagogies and documentary to instigate dialogue and problem solving about waste? And what might we learn about the perception of waste from the vantage of a bike? Full confession, I'm an avid cyclist and COVID pushed me even farther into my interest of moving away from my screen and into the world. And 
Throughout the project, an emergent question came up, which is how can we use augmented documentary towards pedagogies, dialogue, and even problem solving around waste? So the course was an opportunity to learn more about waste in our city and to advance our shared commitments to co-creation, embodied pedagogy, and environmental activism. Discard scholar Max Liberant suggests in their book, Pollution is Colonialism, that pollution is not a manifestation or a side effect of colonialism, but is rather an enactment of ongoing colonial relations. So we were very inspired by land-based and decolonizing pedagogies, and we wanted to explore the relationship between waste, colonialism, and discard studies. And for us, that meant thinking about waste as a, as a set of relations. So this opened up a set of ethical questions. And after running the first iteration of the course, we shared a sprawling Google map with our friend and colleague, Kim Grinfeeder, a professor and creative technologist at the University of Miami. He suggested that rather than using our map to explain to students where they might go, he suggested that we use his locative app and he made a very generous offer. He had developed this app called Know Your Grove, which is an augmented walking tour of one of Miami's oldest neighborhoods, Coconut Grove. And Kim generously offered a chance to reskin his app, an ideal invitation for a project based on waste and repurposing. So we said yes, and using Kim's app was an opportunity, not simply for reuse, but it was also an opportunity to work with creative constraints. So we could think alongside, think with Kim in how he had programmed his own app. And Kim had designed his app to one, direct users to different places using a GPS prompt. Two, once in place, a user could unlock media content. The content is not available unless you're there. It's a bit like the Pokemon logic. The user is rewarded by being there. And three, once in place, the user can access a short audio clip, images, and text. And so by working with Kim's design and these particular creative constraints, we were then able to focus on place and the interactions around the media in place. So we have been designing tours for educators around different neighborhoods and thematics. To date, we have seven tours. And then we've been working with educators to design assignments with personal and collective prompts. The constraints of the app permitted us to make our media smaller and our connection to place bigger. I was coming out of a period of exploring 360 film, Oculus headsets, and other forms of expanded documentary. And I'm going to admit that the lightness of the app was very appealing. But working with an app as a form of expanded documentary also presented new contradictions. For example, how would we communicate the impact of cell phones and electronic waste circuits as part of the tour? In his book, Reassembling Rubbish, Worlding Electronic Waste, Joss Leposky dismantles the logic that e-waste is simply a problem at the end of a product's life cycle, like when you upgrade your cell phone. He suggests that we need to consider each stage of electronic waste production, from the mining to clicking to the eventual disposal. And he suggests that we need to defamiliarize or reframe naturalized stories of waste, make them strange again, in order to find more equitable solutions. So this method of defamiliarization became an objective for the tours. We wanted to make strange the fact that corporations have no responsibility for the life cycles of products like our cell phones. We wanted to make strange our daily waste patterns and the pathways, as well as the electronic devices we were using for the tour. And finally, we wanted to 
So, so all of these path, all of the cycling paths were designed around pre-established cycling paths in the city. So we wanted to use the app to interrupt commutes and encourage users towards a heightened sense of observation. We wanted to augment relationalities through careful and intentional observation, smelling, seeing, hearing, and touching. And so I want to just play a clip from one of our tours, um, a documentation from one of our tours, uh, which I will start now. Five official tours, they're all along bike paths. And each tour is meant to kind of follow a path maybe you've been on before but haven't thought of, kind of defamiliarize it. You are now on Passerelle du Cosmos, in the midst of a thousand kilometer long watershed that has shaped and has been shaped by the human and more than human communities it sustains. Just behind us is Ile Saint Hélène, an island with a long history. As you look at this Olympic basin, 2.2 kilometers long, 110 meters wide, and 2.5 meters deep, think about how much water has been contained and privatized for safety, access, and leisure. Just like the nearby Jean Doré Beach. But water also overflows spills over or wreaks havoc. And while clean pools and artificial lakes are visible features of this landscape, another form of containment hides in plain sight, just a few hundred meters away. The St. Lawrence Seabrook, an engineered basin more than 300 times longer than this one. Fifty-nine square kilometers of land were engulfed by water, forcing thousands of people in Quebec and Ontario to move. Nine lost villages were famously flooded in Ontario. These villages were rebuilt not far from their original homes. But when Indigenous communities lost lands to the seaway, they didn't receive the same recognition or compensation. banks were slowly eroded by the waves of ships sailing along them. In some places, the currents have become so strong that they impede the movement of many species of migratory fish, unable to swim against the water. Dredging also affected the spawning and feeding grounds of species like Sometimes species are displaced and considered invasive, and sometimes we displace them intentionally, importing them into new environments for aesthetic or educational purposes. Wetlands are amongst the most endangered ecosystems in the world, and Canada is home to nearly a quarter of what remains. Since the pre-colonial period, we have lost more than half of the wetlands that were around the St. Lawrence lowlands. When you're actually in the space looking at the thing, you know, breathing the air, you understand it in a, in a much, much more, uh, much more personal level, I guess, rather than just like sitting at your computer reading about it. Um, that's kind of like incomparable, and I wish there was more stuff like that. So thank you for indulging me and in sharing uh, that online. I <laughs> know it can be challenging. Um, and I just want to appreciate Isabel Boucher, who did uh, most of the writing for this tour, and also the Force Space, who helped us to document that. Um, so I hope I give you a little bit of a taste of one of our seven tours. And I want to speak to some of the artists and walking tours that 
have come before us and that we think of as um, artists who we're in conversation with, for example, um, grassroots toxic tours that take people to industrial plants and toxic sites to raise awareness. Toxic tours came of age in the 1970s and they continue today. Phaedra Pazulo in her book, Toxic Tourism, Rhetorics of Travel, Pollution and Environmental Justice, suggest that toxic tours subvert touristic encounters or dark tourism by incorporating a collective call to action, by using the convening to think about a future action, and by offering information about industrial waste practices that is often very difficult to find out about. We were also inspired by environmental augmented artists like Tamiko Thiel, who has been doing augmented documentary for over a decade. Patty Zimmerman and I wrote an article for The Edge about Tamiko's work and about other augmented documentary projects that have inspired us. And in the article, we quote Tamiko Thiel, who suggests that augmentation has the power to transform our mobile devices into AR scopes, allowing us to perceive parallel and overlapping dimensions. She personally uses augmentation to visualize stories that are disappearing or simply outside of the public imagination. And she begins her projects with a key prompt question. What happened here? I love that question. Um, and I thought this was a nice moment to kind of talk about the affordances of an augmented documentary. I've mentioned what um, Tamiko has, has suggested, but I also want to speak to what Jill Ditter and Lazie Fan um, discuss, which is this idea of location depth, the ability to put into conversation multiple layers of place in a single location. William Eurekio has also reminded us that we experience most documentaries without any kind of spatial or place context. So the story of a place told in that place has unique affordances. And finally, what we as a team of wastescapes have been discovering is that augmentation has the potential to augment relationalities with humans, with more than humans, through place-based sensory engagement involving smelling, seeing, hearing, touching, and in many cases, just slowing down. There are, of course, many challenges that were a part of this project and continue to be a part of a project um, like this, which is indeed a living documentary project. Um, for one, Managers of waste sites do not appreciate unexpected visitors. Most waste sites in a city are cordoned off with security signs and gates. Many are situated in industrial areas with heavy tra truck traffic. They do not welcome pedestrians or cyclists. And even at Concordia, where we have a visit, a tour as well, I've had students from other universities turn up to sites and later explain how uncomfortable they felt when staff ask them, what are you doing in this particular place? Number two, places change and they're very unpredictable. And this has happened many times on our tours. This panther, for example, in the image, which is made out of recycled materials, has been the mascot for a political struggle over what was once a steel yard and is currently a highly contaminated, but deeply appreciated and community claimed area. It's on our tour. And at one point, the local residents had removed the sculpture to protect it um, when there was a threat of a land seizure. And a few students came back very confused, like, well, we didn't see the panther. Number three, there are ongoing access issues that we had to consider, like access for differently abled individuals. Not everybody rides a bike, wants to get on a bike. Um, or walks. So for one of our tours, I had a student who mapped out all the locations and created an additional map to help identify bathrooms, shade, and even pathways for wheelchairs. But a storm or ice or any kind of weather can make 
of route that has been mapped out before complex or impossible to navigate. Another complication, we've discovered that audiences for our tours are best done in groups of 20 or less. So we do the group tours, but you can also do the wayscapes on your own. So this is what I would say a very narrow impact, very narrow social impact. And we're trying to think about how to connect to larger communication efforts. Um, the challenges that we face are big, they're enormous. So we don't imagine that Wayscapes is going to turn the curve. But for this project, uh, we're going for a kind of narrow outreach strategy. But I think it is important to continue to think about how we can connect to larger efforts. And lastly, the documentary is seasonal. So there's about four months out of the year when it's not so great to ride a bike in Montreal. You can get to most of these tours on skis or on foot, provided that you're using Cramptons. But this particular documentary is best experienced in the spring or the fall. So to turn now to the potential for critical place-based learning. One of the things that I have thought about a lot with augmented documentary and with all of the media projects I've been a part of is how to engage audiences. The primary target audience for this project is local educators, students, and cycling enthusiasts or walkers. I myself began using the app in a place-based methods course in some of the new media courses that I've taught and with educators from other institutes. And part of the approach to critical place-based learning is about awakening, awakening the senses, but also about thinking across temporalities. So in a tour or in a course, I usually begin with Tamiko's question, what happened here? And the app helps offer some context for that. And then we build in other questions in the present. And I'll, if I'm not with the students, I'll send them out with a set of questions like who uses this place? Who cares for or maintains this place? What forms of labor take place or have taken place here? And I ask individuals to take time to listen, to sense, to think in place. So we're asking them to engage with a slower temporality, to move beyond a shallow media experience to a deeper engagement with both the media and the place. And then what I found has been so far the most fun in working around critical place-based learning is asking students to speculate on the future of a site. So we've used anywhere between 10 and 20 years. We usually set up what can happen in 10 to 20 years. And we ask them, what's a worst case scenario of what might happen to this place? What's a best case scenario? What does the place want? And what do they want for the place? And I can guarantee this has opened up some really exciting conversations and engaged students in thinking about their own agency and their ability to problem solve. The image that you see here under future is a futurist scenario of an, an incinerator that is no longer in use in our city that the student Lily Watts has designed as a vibrant local market. So this is just one uh, solution that students have come up with, but there are many. And I want to take a moment. A lot of the Wayscapes tour features invisible infrastructures throughout the city related to waste. So I wanted to also feature the invisible infrastructure of this app. The app is built on a database and it permits me <laughs> to keep expanding and opening to more and future partnerships. So here you see the back end of the project and I can basically uh, turn things on or off depending on um, the activity of the partner in a given moment. So I'm currently developing a few more tours with new collaborators. Um, one of the tours is around the concept of, and, and we're just in the beginning of developing this, but it's about informal urban green spaces in our city and it's part of a collaboration with three biologists and a political scientist who are invested in commoning biodiversity 
and the potential of small and abandoned urban sites for their ability to mitigate heat and foster biodiversity. So we're using the app to get students to visit former, a former waste dump that is a community run and managed urban space. It's an informal park. And the app, we're hopefully all four of us are gonna be using it in our different courses. And it will permit us to feature the history of the site as well as our collective thinking and doing around the site. Another way that I am opening up the app is uh, with food scholars at my university, food and waste scholars and staff and students. And so um, we're piloting, I think in 10 days, we're piloting a walk called University as Living Lab. And we will be working with staff, faculty, and students to identify the history of waste and food innovations at Concordia. Uh, so this is involving six of us, and each of us are identifying a site, the his, uh, speaking to the history of that site, and initiating a sensory prompt. So this will be a walk. And finally, um, I am working with a science museum in the city. It's called the Biosphere. And we are launching a film that will run for one year. And the film will actually um, premiere in a company with a walking tour. So the idea is the film is called As the Gulf Flies and it features, and it's about the relationship between ring-billed ring gulls and waste. And once people finish watching the film, we wanna encourage them to walk outside explore the area outside the island, look for uh, these ring-billed gulls and um, use their senses to connect to the place. So these are just a few ways that uh, we're using the app to build partnerships and an expanded experience of documentary. And so I just wanna end with a prompt and a discussion um, which is this question of how can we use augmented documentary to recover public accountability to each other, to urban spaces, and to the more than human species that live with us and that are vital for our collective survival? And then the other thing I've been trying to think about is bike itself as environmental media. Might we consider the bike and bike paths in, of, in and of themselves as expanded documentary media? So with that, I will stop sharing and uh, I welcome our discussion. Yeah.